Um, and the purpose of starting the recording is so that people can look back at this session. Um, if you don't belong to London Met, you can email me and I can send you a copy of the recording. I just popped my email address in the chat box. OK, so this is the third of our sessions. Um, are your questions answered, fact or fiction? Um, the over, overarching group that we're under is the London Met Lab. And today we're going to talk specifically about the, the virus. And every time we do one of these sessions, it seems to coincide with another new piece of information that's, that is released to the public through the news. So I hope you enjoy this session as much as we've enjoyed setting it up. So in, in answer to who are we, we are London Met Academics and in response to the pandemic and the anxieties that we all have surrounding the safety of vaccinations, whether masks and social distancing work and the nature and behaviour of the COVID-19 virus, um, London Met Labs is hosting a series of fact or fiction events where the expert panel will answer your pre-submitted questions and explore with you the topics that most concern you and our community. So this is your opportunity to hear about things that you may have been shouting at the TV about for months, to clarify complex topics and to understand how it relates to you. To underline the importance, the severity of this pandemic, over 127,000 people, unfortunately, in the UK have lost their lives to this virus. Over 2.9 million people similarly have lost their lives across the world. And there have been 134 million cases of COVID so far, and that number changes every day. So my name's Dr. Una Fairbrother. I'm a reader in molecular genomics, head of research and development and head of the research um, ethics subcommittee of the university. My research interests are DNA and RNA, and I've taught in biomedical science and biological science for 25 years. That's also a number that keeps going up every day. Um, and I'm also running our COVID testing centres at the, the, at the university. And um, we would like to offer you an unbiased perspective on the virus, its behaviour and origins to help you make informed decisions on how you interpret what you hear in the news and the social media. Just a caveat, COVID is an extremely dangerous virus which can kill in the short term and, as we're discovering, can cause long-term harm as well. I'd like to pass over to Professor White. Hello, I'm uh, Professor Ken White. I'm a professor of molecular biosciences. So I have particular interest in molecular aspects of the virus, um, what, what molecules make it up, how they work, and also how they change uh, as the virus evolves. I'll, say, I'll be saying a little bit about those points. And uh, Associate Professor Yuff. Hi, um, I'm Head of Student Experience and Academic Outcomes for the School of Human Sciences. I've been a biomedical scientist since the early 90s. I was a science practitioner before and I have a big interest in infection control and managing the transmission of diseases. Today I'm going to operate the chat box for you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Chandler. Hi, I'm Chris Chandler. I'm Head of Psychology. Um, my area of interest is in mental health, but specifically in addiction, but I will have a broader interest and uh, able to offer a, a, a psychological perspective uh, within the mental health framework. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Professor Inel. Oh, hello. I'm Professor of Immunobiology. Um, after a degree in microbiology, where I began to have an interest in infectious disease, I did a PhD and postdoctoral period for about 10 years in which I was working in vaccine design actually but against bacterial and parasitic diseases. Um, thank you. That's lovely, thank you very much. Dr Jorfi. Hi there, my name is Dr Samuel Jorfi, I'm a senior lecturer in biosciences and my research interests are in viral infection, cancer research and microplastics in health and disease. I'm glad to be here to talk to you about the coronavirus today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Anna Baker. 
Thank you. Um, I'm a um, health psychologist and senior lecturer in psychology. So um, I do research in chronic disease and mental health. Um, but I have worked with pharmaceutical um, uh, companies um, over the past um, 12 years and uh, looking at how we support patients and behavior change. And as part of that, um, you know, supporting informed treatment decision making. Thank you very much, Dr. Hills. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Stephen Hills. I'm a senior lecturer in the Guildhall School of Business and Law, and I'm director of the Health Economics Research Group. Uh, my interests uh, lie primarily on social distancing and vaccine uptake with regard to the, the ongoing pandemic, and I'm currently working with the NHS on some research on these issues. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to kick off with um, this slide that's called What's in a Name and talk to you about the name of the coronavirus, which is perhaps a little bit confusing. So the disease, coronavirus disease, is COVID-19. That was named by the World Health Organization um, on the 11th of February 2020. Um, and other organizations that were involved in that were the Organization for Animal Health and the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. The virus, which is a severe acute respiratory syndrome caused by coronavirus, coronavirus 2, um, or SARS-CoV-2, which is really the scientific name, um, and that was conferred by the International Committee of Taxonomy of Viruses, and that was also um, given on the 11th of February. So the name was chosen because the virus is related to the coronavirus responsible for the earlier SARS outbreak, which some of you might remember in 2003. So viruses are named based on their genetic structure. And the reason we name them based on their genetic structure is because that helps us develop diagnostic tests, vaccines and medicines to them. And the diseases are named to enable progress in disease prevention, spread and transmissibility, severity and treatment. And diseases are officially named by the WHO and the International Classification of Diseases, ICD. And I've given you a hyperlink to that. I'd like to pass on now to Professor White. Thank you. And I'll say a little bit about uh, the type of virus that coronavirus is. It's called an RNA virus. And this refers to the form of genetic material that it carries uh, it, uh, as its what we call genome. It, the, the instructions uh, in, embedded in genetic material which allow the virus to replicate. So in this uh, diagram here, it's a cross section of a single viral particle. And you can see, hopefully, I, I imagine most people by now have heard about the spike protein because this is the protein that makes contact with human cells. And there's a three dimensional picture of it here. But inside uh, the, the virus itself, there's a membrane. And then we can see this black squiggly line here. This is the genetic material encoding all the viral proteins uh, carried not as DNA, which is the normal form of genetic material, but as RNA. So viruses are, can either be an RNA virus or a DNA virus. In the case of coronavirus, it's an RNA virus. So it carries its genetic material as RNA. So that means it makes its protein slightly more quickly than perhaps is normally the case inside cells. I've shown on the right hand side here what happens normally inside a cell that you have your DNA, which actually is made into RNA and then made into protein. But the coronavirus bypasses the need to having DNA and, and introduces RNA into the cell, which can be converted into viral protein very, very quickly. So that confers some sort of advantage to the virus. It, it can actually reproduce its own proteins and make more viral particles very, very quickly because it carries its genome as an RNA genome. And this also has implications in the uh, changeability or mutation of the genome. The RNA tends to mutate more easily than DNA, but I'll talk about that in a later slide. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, so in these sessions, as I said before, we're answering questions that we were asked and people um, have heard news stories about the virus and where it's originated from. And I just wanted to give a little outline of that. So everything points scientifically to the horseshoe bat, um, which is the viral reservoir. And that's a picture of a horseshoe bat. And I think they're very cute. Um, 
when we look at DNA sequence, it enables us to match that sequence and work out where it came from. So evolutionary analysis suggests that the originating virus was present in bats for about 20 to 30 years. So this has been sitting there almost like an unexploded bomb. The fact that um, SARS-CoV-2 was first detected in Wuhan, China, is actually far from where the horseshoe bat is found, suggests that there must have been an intermediary. And the intermediary for this is thought to be a pangolin. And this is thought to be the missing link. So there's a picture of a pangolin. And um, pangolin scales are used um, for traditional medicine. Um, so that they would have been present in, a mar in such a market as, as, uh, uh, as we think that the virus came from in Wuhan. However, we can dismiss the theory that this new virus escaped or was deliberately released from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There's absolutely no evidence for that. And scientifically, and people have looked, if the virus had been human made, it would show in the genome sequence. Um, so if you're going to create a coronavirus that can be transmitted to humans, you would almost certainly start with a known virus. And we can see that that hasn't happened. SARS-CoV-2 is like nothing else we've seen before. It's highly unlikely that somebody created it and put it together from pieces that we know about. And if you want to follow up any of these pieces of information that we've given you, it's all from published peer reviewed literature and that came from The Lancet. Another question that people have asked, um, uh, and it seems a little bit different from the origin of the virus, but about testing. So at the moment, uh, we've currently got two sorts of tests. We've got lateral flow tests and PCR tests. And I just want to take a few minutes to talk about those tests and maybe put to bed some fears. So a lateral flow test, which in fact are the tests that we offer at the university on the instigation of the government, are just like a pregnancy test for those people, for the women in the audience, actually. <laughs> so these tests use antibodies and they recognize proteins. So they recognize COVID proteins. And that's important because recognizing the protein is specific to this test. So the sample is applied to one end of the little plastic cassette and it passes over the antibodies, triggers a color change, and you get two bands like you do in a pregnancy test. You get the actual test band and a control band. If you're negative, you'll just see the control band. If you're positive, you'll see both. And if you haven't done the test properly, you won't see the bands at all. Now, the other test that you will have heard of is the PCR test. So I put this diagram and it was fairly complicated, but I wanted to use it because I think it's quite interesting. So at the bottom here, you've got days and up here, you've got amount of viral particles. So if somebody were exposed um, to um, the, the COVID virus here, um, what happens is you, there's a lag between being exposed and feeling ill. And there's actually a lag between being exposed and being infectious. So what happens is you incubate the virus. So it starts replicating, as Professor White just discussed. And then um, in people with a normal progression of COVID, they um, develop symptoms at about day five. And that's the point where they're shedding lots of proteins which which can be picked up by the lateral flow test so at this point a person is symptomatic and shedding proteins but you can see that there's a difference between a test positive on this side and a test positive on this side on this side one is about to become infectious and on the other side one has been infectious so pcr tests continue to be positive from throat, throat swabs about 17 days afterwards, uh, after um, exposure. So the PCR test picks up the presence of the RNA, even when you're not symptomatic and possibly after you've, you're getting better. The lateral flow test detect protein shedding, which is causes infection transmission. Okay, so all the way through this story, PCR will pick up the RNA. But the lateral flow tests tell you, are you infectious today? 
So if you have a test positive um, lateral flow test, you are infectious. If you test positive with PCR, you might be becoming infectious or you might be getting better. So there are the difference with differences between the tests. And because if you have a positive PCR, we don't know what stage you are, people are advised to um, self-isolate for 14 days. I'd like to pass on to Professor White now. OK, uh, yes, I can say a little bit about the variants of the virus that have cropped up and, and why, how do they occur? So this rather complicated but colourful uh, slide um, illustrates what's going on, hopefully, and I'll try and unpick it for you. So if we start on the left hand side, we've got actually a, a time scale. It's starting at around December 2019 when the first isolate of SARS-CoV-2 was, uh, was obtained from Wuhan in China. So that's the sort of starting point. And what has happened, of course, that, that's, that uh, virus has been passed on to many, many people. And along the way, samples of virus have been sequenced. Um, we've mentioned natural flow tests, we've mentioned PCR tests, but those tests don't actually identify um, uh, mutations. It's only when you sequence the virus that you identify the mutations. And in fact, in the UK, we are very good at sequencing. So in fact, a lot of the data about variation, a lot of it comes from, from the UK. But um, increasingly around the world now, we are monitoring the, the, the different strains of virus. And what happens is when the virus reproduces itself, when it reproduces its RNA, occasionally there are, there are mistakes made. and um, if you look at the bottom scale here, this is actually a scale of, of the um, code, uh, of, the R, of the letters, if you like, in the RNA genome. In other words, there are about 30,000 RNA letters, which are the code for making the, the viral proteins. And this graph shows you where the mutations tend to occur in that code. And if we just focus on this region here that I'm, I'm outlining at the moment, this is the region where the spike protein is actually encoded in the RNA. So this is a region where there's a lot of mutation going on, and sometimes that can change the ability of the virus to infect, as we all know about, for example, the UK strain and also the South African strain. So what this uh, colorful picture here shows that there are, we can uh, plot the Different, the um, evolution of different strains of viruses, and they are grouped together, they're sort of color coded basically, and they're grouped together in what they call clades or, or if you like, families. And so there's a family down here which is very closely linked to the Wuhan virus, and eventually other clades or, or strains have evolved as the RNA mutates. Now, some of the mutations will make the virus grow better or the same or perhaps worse, and so this is sort of molecular evolution in action. And we can see right at the top here that we've got the more recent uh, families of virus uh, evolving uh, uh, later on. This is now October 2020, and this is when the UK strain emerged. And, we, and a lot of this data comes from the UK. And this is a global map of, of showing you the uh, distribution of the different strains or different families of virus uh, according to countries. I recommend going to uh, this website. It's all live. If you pass your mouse over the, uh, any of these, you'll get a, a lot of information. So it's actually very informative and interesting to have a look at. So the variants occur, therefore, uh, through natural molecular evolution. And um, they evolve, the, the virus evolves into different families. And there are about five different strains of concern at the moment around the world. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hills. OK, so what do uh, these, these variants mean for, for our health? So. Um, <clears throat> you might recall thinking back to when the, the Kent variant was discovered uh, that there was some, some genuine fear that it was going to be more deadly than the, the previous strain of the coronavirus that was dominant in the UK. Um, but what research has, has recently found is that although it is indeed more transmissible, it is not um, being found to be associated with increased disease severity and death. So although we're going to see more cases, we're going to see more infections, uh, the, 
the severity um, of the disease does not increase with the, the Kent um, variant. That's the, the most recent two studies that have been published on this, although there was a previous study that did actually um, suggest that there, there was a greater risk from death, but this hasn't subsequently been found in other research. Uh, the variant that I'm most uh, worried about um, is the Brazil variant, because uh, this is also likely to be more transmissible um, because what we're seeing in South America is a huge surge of, of cases, uh, not just in Brazil, but in um, other areas of South America, um, in particular Colombia at, at the moment. Um, and we're seeing that health systems uh, are, are being uh, um, overwhelmed um, across a lot of uh, South America to the point where um, you have huge queues of ambulances uh, outside Sao Paulo uh, hospitals, um, but they're unable to take any more patients in. Uh, in Colombia, what's happening at the moment, um, in particular in the second largest city of, of, Med of Medellin, they're taking in patients, but they don't have any beds or ventilators for them. So all they can do is put them on a mattress on the floor and give them morphine, um, but they're not able to uh, to do anything to to treat uh, COVID. So we, we're really seeing that uh, health systems are being overwhelmed in uh, South America. Um, and uh, some other worrying numbers coming from South America with regard to the Brazil variant is that 50% of patients in Brazil ICUs are under 40. So this is, is bucking the previous uh, trend and, and it um, seems uh, Sorry, I, I'm not sure how good my connection is there. So I'll, I'll just uh, speak a, a, a bit. OK, um, good. It seems that everybody else can hear. Um, uh, so an, another statistic that is concerning is that it's, it, the Brazil variant seems to be bucking the trend of it, of uh, of risk to, to different age groups. And we're, we're seeing that younger people are now uh, occupying a lot of the ICU beds in Brazil and also that we're seeing in, the, in excess of 4,000 deaths per day in Brazil. So the Brazil variant is one that um, worries me quite quite a lot. Um, what do the, the variants mean for our, our vaccines? So, you know, this is this is a big threat to us. Is there going to be a, a variant that is a real um, vaccine buster? And what we've what we've seen is that vaccines have indeed been found to be less effective in stopping infections uh, from the variants. Uh, in particular, the efficacy of the Oxford vaccine decreased from 70% to 10% against South, the South African variant in a trial in South Africa. So this is very um, worrying. However, what is a little bit reassuring at least is that there is currently no evidence that the vaccines are less effective in stopping severe COVID and deaths from variants. And uh, just using some uh, data from, uh, again, from, uh, from South America, we can see that even where uh, a vaccine isn't working very well at stopping infections, it is working in terms of, of uh, stopping uh, death. So um, if we think about uh, the Sinovac vaccine, which is one that doesn't, hasn't been found to have a very good efficacy, um, it's only been found to have a, a 50%, just over 50% efficacy. Well, uh, Chile have done a great job of, of rolling out that vaccine, but um, surprisingly, we've still seen a huge uh, spike in cases of coronavirus in Chile, even though they've done really well in, in rolling out the vaccine. Um, but what is interesting is that although the cases have gone up, although we've seen a huge surge in cases in Chile post the, the vaccine rollout, this hasn't translated to another spike in deaths. So if we look at the first wave in Chile, the, the peak was at um, 5,956. And in the current wave that's been experienced, that's higher um, at 7,276, even after the vaccine rollout. But then if we look at the, the peak of uh, the seven day average of deaths in the first wave, this was 223. But now in the current wave, it's only 127. So if we look at this in terms of death to cases ratio in the first wave, it was 3.74 percent. 
but um, post the vaccine rollout, it's only 1.75%. So what we're seeing is that there's a 50% drop in deaths to cases ratio after 25% of adults, the most vulnerable, have been fully vaccinated. So just like we're seeing in the UK, there's now a disassociation between cases and deaths after the vaccine rollout has happened. So even with the very potent Brazil variant, we're still seeing that a, a vaccine which doesn't have a good efficacy profile is still effective in uh, protecting against death. So we can take um, some solace in that, um, but we should still be very concerned that uh, um, the vaccines aren't necessarily going to give us amazing protection against infection. Thank you very much for that. Professor Inel. Yes, so the question here was whether the virus uh, will become endemic uh, in the future. Of course, we're in a pandemic. Become a sort of more common infection. <clears throat> and in fact, before I start, I mean, there are uh, at least four quite common coronaviruses um, in the human population, which cause nothing more than the common cold. Then there are the slightly more serious uh, MERS and SARS-CoV, the original uh, coronavirus that uh, broke out from Hong Kong uh, some time ago. So the question about whether SARS-CoV-2 will become endemic, um, this is again something that we can only speculate upon, so there's no right or wrong answer to this, but it, one can speculate that it is likely that this infection will become endemic in the human population. Um, so there's several things that one can consider. For example, at the moment, it's the fact is that children seem to have only a mild infection. So they will get infected in early life and they are more likely to build up some degree of immunity over their lives. Um, in trying, what we can also do is look at genetic sequences of viruses and try to predict what might happen. And we can do this and, and try to work backwards, in fact. So by comparing the genetic material of known viruses and try to figure out where mutations have occurred and new strains have arisen. So an example of this would be, for example, one of these endemic uh, human coronaviruses that we have causing the common cold, uh, HCOV-043. Uh, it's now become endemic, but we know that this caused the pandemic in the late 1800s and it was derived from a bovine coronavirus which jumped from cattle to humans. So as uh, Professor White said, I mean the, the SARS-CoV-2 will go on acquiring mutations and of course these mutations uh, will help the virus survive in the human population so that it is likely to become endemic. Um, the only way of preventing, of preventing this pandemic and, and in getting to a situation where the virus becomes endemic would be um, an effective control and so that's that's dependent on the current vaccines being rolled out across the whole world. So this coupled with uh, the build-up of immunity across the population as I said uh, especially the young people over their lifespan they will build up this immunity. One can speculate that yes it will become an endemic uh, virus and cause seasonal uh, uh, infection and so on. Thank you. So the question was, how will we live with it? Just to echo on what uh, Professor Rinal just mentioned, there was a survey that carried out by the uh, Journal of Nature in January to 2021, and scientists from across different uh, disciplines took part, more than 100 immunologists, infectious disease researchers, and virologists that work on um, COVID-19. And 90% of them um, expect they, they said that they expect this um, coronavirus to become kind of endemic and more than one third of them they said uh, it is possible to kind of eliminate this COVID-19 uh, and uh, the virus by itself in some regions of the world um, and this as a result of this um, um, 
ability of the virus to keep mutating. They said that uh, the viral mutation uh, kind of, we need to have a booster to tackle if there are going to be more uh, mutations in the virus, like the flu vaccine that every year people get the uh, flu jab. And um, the future of um, the future impact of the COVID-19 as well also depend on how well we it, it establishes itself in in the wild animal population, because um, we have this um, experience from other diseases such as Ebola or yellow fever, um, disease that been under control, but because they are kind of they have animal reservoir, they kind of persist and they keep coming back because um, coronavirus itself is um, originated probably in bats and can readily infect other animals such as cats, rabbits, and hamsters, and so on. So there is possibilities that we might need kind of booster to just keep it under control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hills. Oh, his internet connection doesn't seem to be working. Um, so I think we'll have to wait for Dr. Hill to rejoin and um, we will go back to his slide. So can I ask you to carry on, Dr. Jorfi? Yes, sure. So the question was, why are people of color more vulnerable uh, than others to coronavirus? Um, this came after reports that were published last year by Public Health England and Office of National Statistics, and they showed that the emerging evidence base suggests that individuals in Black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups are at increased risk of mortality due to COVID-19. Um, so those of uh, Black African and Black Caribbean descent appear to be at greatest increased risk. And um, they kind of link this to health inequalities um, known to affect the BAME communities in England and um, kind of maybe increasing the risk of uh, transmission due to accommodation, for example, overcrowded housing, um, reliance on uh, transport, living in population centers, and the risk of mortality, high underlying risk of comorbidities, like other underlying conditions such as cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and obesity. So understanding the impact of COVID-19 on BAME communities across the uh, country may uh, have led to further economic or housing instability. So this is something uh, to be considered by the government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor now. Yeah. Okay. So the question here is: uh, After two vaccines, how protected will we be? Well, the first thing is to uh, not worry about the fact that some vaccines need to to be given uh, twice. That we need a booster jab. Um, the first dose of the vaccine builds up the protective immunity, but the second is often needed. And it's a, a reinforcement of that initial protective effect, an enhancement of it. It's not that unusual. And there are other vaccines that um, require two doses, for example, with the MMR vaccine and viruses, uh, vaccines against hepatitis A and B. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost as if you are you know, pushing a heavy piece of furniture across the room with, with a friend. But then if two more friends come along and help you push it, it's much easier. So. In terms of this question, uh, how protected, if we look at the current crop of vaccines, the Pfizer-BioNTech is giving an efficacy of about 95% and complete protection against hospitalization and death. The Moderna, which is an mRNA, mRNA vaccine, also requires two doses and gives an efficacy of about 95%. Again, complete protection against hospitalization and death. The Oxford AstraZeneca, which is an adenovirus-based vaccine, requires the two doses and uh, currently about 70 percent overall protection the johnson and johnson vaccine which is interestingly also an adenovirus which just requires one dose uh, is giving slightly uh, the highest effectivity that we've found is at 72 percent and then there's the novavax vaccine which is a protein-based vaccine two doses again giving just under 90 percent protection 
Thank you very much, Professor Inal. If I could just go back to Dr. Hill's slides now, and then I'll get you back to people's responses, if that's okay, because he's managed to join us again. So I'm going to take you back to why do we see waves, Dr. Hills? Thank you very much. Apologies for that um, disconnection. So uh, why do we see waves? This was um, uh, a question that um, at, at first I didn't know the answer to, so I've had to go away and do uh, do a bit of research to to find out what's going on with with these waves. Um, and what we we've seen that the waves that we're we're seeing are nothing new. And if we look at here what happened with the Spanish flu uh, in the UK all the way back in 1918 and 1919, that that we did see see waves with with that um, pandemic as well. And we're we're seeing them again uh, with with the current pandemic, with the current COVID pandemic. And in terms of when we're, we're looking to, to have a more accurate reflection of the waves, the best thing to look at is actually the deaths because um, whereas for the, the first uh, wave of the pandemic in the UK, we didn't have widespread testing. If you look at the deaths, you can actually see that uh, the, the second wave um, was, was larger, uh, but um, only marginally so. But if you were to look at cases, it would, it would appear a, a, a vastly different uh, situation. So why, why do they occur? Um, and the answer is, is that um, we're not completely sure. Um, and this is because there haven't been a lot of pandemics, so we don't have a lot of uh, conclusive evidence. But um, there seems to be four factors that are uh, play a role. So first of all, seasonality. Um, and it's not actually with COVID, we know that um, when the summer comes, it's not the hot weather that is protecting us against the virus. And we know this because we, the even um, in countries and climates where it's very hot, we're still seeing outbreaks of the virus. So it's not the hot weather in itself um, that's influencing uh, the, the um, infection in the patterns that we're seeing um, but it's because <clears throat> when it's colder we're indoors and when we're indoors um, it, we can see that um, we see in the data that it's you're more likely to um, incur an infection indoor the, the virus is more likely to spread indoors and that's why uh, on the basis of this data we're seeing the the lock the easing of lockdown measures um, in in the roadmap where uh, you can go to the pub but you can only go to the pub outdoors. You're not yet able to go and um, sit in, inside a pub and have a pint. So seasonality um, has an effect because we're more likely to be indoors. And then another thing that changes the, um, the waves and the shape of the waves, and this was something that I spoke about in a previous session, and that we can see with the UK wave is that when there's a lockdown, of course, it brings down um, infections and that's why we've seen such a steep downturn in the number of cases uh, within the within the UK and now that we're um, releasing uh, restrictions there is inev inevitably going to be an, an uptake in cases and we just hope that the vaccines work well enough that as the cases increase the deaths um, and uh, hospitalizations uh, and severe COVID don't increase. Um, another factor is susceptibility. So um, protection from antibodies can wane um, and people that were not previously susceptible become susceptible again. Or um, as uh, Professor White um, was talking about, the virus mutates such that protection from a previous variant um, is not effective against a new variant. So this is a biological factors that may be contributing to the different waves. Um, and we, we also know that reintroduction of the virus is possible. So even if a virus is controlled within a territory, it can be introduced from another territory, uh, hence the need for quarantine. And, and we've seen this uh, in um, Australia, for example, where it seems that there's no cases and then um, uh, a case gets brought into the, con the country and it's the uh, reintroduction and we see a slight slight peak until they get back into control. So um, thinking across these uh, these different factors, the general consensus in the scientific community is that the behavioural factors such as um, lockdowns, uh, um, social distancing, um, they're the, the, the most important driving factors, but the, the biological factors such as susceptibility um, are also playing a role. Excellent, thank you very much. Right, I'm going to forward now on to uh, the second part of Professor Anal's 
um, slides, which are why are people's responses to the virus so different? So, Professor Inal. Thank you, Ines. So, yes, I'm, I'm not going to claim to have the answer to this by any means, and I don't think anyone can. So I've just offered some um, suggestions for why people's responses to this virus are so different. So one thing to consider could be the speed at which the virus is able to replicate. Uh, once it infects a person, uh, that may play a role. Uh, another factor could be uh, the individual's specific immune response and, of course, their genetic makeup. Uh, there could be some form of autoimmune response as well, and that could be whereby the immune response goes into a overdrive. This overzealous immune response could end up attacking our own body. And of course, we all, we've all heard about the cytokine storm, for example. Uh, could it be that there's some degree uh, of immunity against other coronaviruses that can be helping and, and therefore reducing the, um, the illness in certain people? Uh, what about the viral load? That's again something to consider and that um, I mean, sort of ties in with the um, speed of the infection and so on and the degree of symptoms that may be suffered. And finally, the, uh, the last question I've put here is, is well, we know that the SARS-CoV-2 mainly infects the airways and, and lungs, but uh, we also know that in some cases the virus seems to also affect other organs. So there's a wider tissue tropism and uh, the heart, kidneys, liver and the gastrointestinal tract can be affected. So could this be the virus that's able to um, get to these additional sites? Um, or again, could it be down to an inappropriate immune response? Thank you, Professor Chandler. Uh, thank you. Right. So, so this is about trust in medical advice. Um, why some people are more likely to trust than others. And, and Anna will be talking a little bit more about the conspiracy theories that this this also sort of lends itself to. But what I think is, is quite interesting, and this is coming from a pre-pandemic or pre-COVID-19 pandemic uh, research study that was done by the Wellcome Global Monitor in 2018, so well before we were in the position that we are now, it was that 73% of the people across the world that were, were assessed would rather trust a doctor or a nurse rather than any other uh, form of health advice or, or, or coming from family, friends or, or, or religious leaders or even indeed our famous people that seem to occupy social media so much. Um, and following on for that, again, pre-pandemic, um, nearly 80% of those agree that vaccines were safe, which we're hearing a lot of at the moment that isn't, uh, and 84% agree that they are effective. So that's quite an optimistic uh, set of, of numbers that would indicate that the vast majority of people across the world are uh, trusting the medical advice that comes along. But it isn't consistent in every country and in every uh, territory. There are variations and we're seeing in America that there are dips in those numbers now uh, and that they are a departure from what we're experiencing in the UK where there is a relatively high, around about 90% trust in, in medical information coming out from uh, um, the, the medical people. One of the big factors that is, is a global factor for trust, and we have to remember that trust is, is a small world word that we use, that we all have a fairly consistent understanding of what it means, but when we start to dig down into what it actually is comprised of, it, it's, it's multifaceted. But across the globe, it, it, it would appear that the biggest predictor of trusting medical information is whether you've had uh, been in education for a longer period of time. So you've gone beyond primary school and you're a college or uh, uh, graduate. Uh, it's independent of whether you come from a wealthy country or not. So that doesn't appear to be a factor it's whether you have had an education in science and of course medicine is really the application of science uh, that we see when you bring government into the into the mix uh, what i thought was quite an interesting uh, view is that um, people who trust the medical advice that decreases when governments start providing the same same message uh, and uh, I'm sure people have lots of opinions about those messages that have been coming from different 
uh, quarters. So the question is, you know, why do certain people trust them and why don't they? Well, there's lots of reasons for that. And it might be lots of reasons for lots of different people, not just the one. For start, you know, when you go for a, a medical appointment, you might have expectations that you're going to get better. And that might not always be the reality. So your expectations may not be met. They may have been unrealistic expectations uh, uh, that could never have been met. But it puts a, a little bit more doubt, a little bit less confidence in, in medicine as it emerges. There might have been particularly negative experiences where, where unpleasant things have happened to you as an individual, but also in the past. And certainly for, for minority groups uh, and certain sectors, there are absolutely appalling historical atrocities that have happened that still remain in, in the history and, and, and people will have knowledge of that, that leads to a distrust about the organisations that are doing this. And, and there are some really appalling uh, 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 accounts out there. Additionally, the, there is a kind of a lack of representation in medicine for, for minoritized groups. Um, you know, it, in Westernized cultures, it, 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 it's very much uh, centered around um, white males, for example. Uh, and not having that representation is also uh, adds to perhaps a, a suspicion uh, and a distrust of a system that has perhaps been not as supportive for you as one would have hoped and then of course there's now what we're seeing is social media is a, a bit of a go-to place the internet and there is a clear negative bias when you start looking at information and a lot of misinformation that is put out there and the ebola uh, uh, crisis that happened a few years back was also a case where misinformation meant that it lasted for a lot longer and the algorithms of, of, of social media also promote echo chambers where we actually just feed off our, our, our own opinions and we don't really challenge our thoughts. So you know, if we have a negative view of, sort of medical uh, and government information, we're probably going to find more support on the Internet uh, than challenges and uh, considerations that may be counter to our beliefs. And then I think perhaps for uh, America more than so here is the economic interests of those that are uh, trying to get um, medicines uh, uh, sold and, and delivered. Um, fortunately, here we, we don't have those interests in the same way, but uh, the idea of um, economic interests are pushing people to uh, uh, engage in certain medical treatments for you makes us wonder why they, they you know what their their motive behind it is and we also want people to listen to us and understand what we are saying rather than uh, treating us as a, a as a condition so all of these factors and many more besides will contribute to whether we have trust in a system of, of, of medical advice or not but i do think the good news is that you know nearly three quarters of the globe are supportive of, of medical advice and what is going on. So I, I, I will finish on there, Una, and pass over to Thank her. you. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass on now to Dr. Baker. Thank you. I mean, so the question I've got is how can people get information from trusted sources? Um, that links into what was Chris, what Chris was saying in terms of trust. Um, and and th this is just a slide I, I, I found on the internet which talks about uh, where people put their trust. But what's important is understanding the kind of credibility. Um, and um, ultimately, um, it's peer-reviewed evidence. And one of the uh, exciting things that's happened in the last year is that sort of speed at which we've had clinical trials pushed out, um, things are being published. And when things are published, they're peer reviewed. So experts are viewing the quality um, of the results and whether the results are actually saying, um, you know, what we think they're saying. Um, it's understanding. And one of the issues we have is we get most of our information 
primarily via the internet and news. Um, one of the aspects we have with news is that's an interpretation of the science. So depending on the quality of, of sources you're going to, it means you're getting an interpretation. And there's been a number of um, cases previously, if we're looking over the last 20, 25 year, years, where um, you know reporters have misinterpreted evidence and reported this, which have led to sort of um, you know effects in in people's behaviours. Um, so, I mean, I would say newspapers, TikTok, Snapchat, FaceTime journalists. Um, it's an interpretation. Um, this will link when I talk into conspiracy theories. Um, but what I've done is I've put some sources of information where these have been checked. So these have to be checked before they're being put online. Um, as health professionals, and you probably um, have heard or met some health professionals who are saying don't have the vaccine. And that can be quite challenging if you think, well, these are the people we trust. But ultimately, scientists are the ones who've tested this out, even health professionals. Um, we do have a professional code of conduct, and we are regulated in terms of looking at the best um, for patients or clients. So this will take me on to the, the next slide. Um, and as I said, I've put some sources. If you want to find out accurate information, you should be going to the NHS and government. This isn't the same as what you are being reported by Boris Johnson um, on a Friday afternoon. This has been regulated. Um, it has been checked for accuracy. So on the next slide, the question I have is, oh, sorry, I've gone over to it. We're both doing it at the same time. Um, why are there so many conspiracy stories and how can we legitimately question without being sidetracked by trolls? Um, some amazing conspiracy um, stories have been coming out in relation to COVID. Um, you know, Chris talked about the aspect of social media. Um, we didn't have social media some time back. For some of you, you won't have um, you know, known in existence without social media. Um, some of us do um, know in existence where there wasn't social media. Um, one of the elements I think, especially with COVID is it affects everybody in, in, in some way. So this might be directly in terms of people you know who have had COVID, but also indirectly in terms of the fact is you can't go out to work. You may not be able to get a job. You're having financial impacts. So it means it's, it's very profound in terms of what we're thinking. We also know that when we're looking at conspiracy theories, people, certain people are more vulnerable. So if you have a sense of anxiety or worry, you don't feel you know enough information, then it means you're likely to sort of tap into messages depending on how strong they are. So when we look at the background to conspiracy theories and where they come from, um, it, it's used to help explain these random events. So when we don't fully understand it, somebody will jump in with an, an opinion and it can really gain momentum. Um, it's also a sense of gaining control. I mean, if you're looking at um, the media around 5G, it's we're looking for an explanation of why these things are happening, whether it's rational or not. Um, we tap into things where we feel we're part of a community and that's that sense of social um, belonging. Chris talked about issues around trust and um, particularly with government. Um, so there may be some political biases in terms of what's going on, um, but people are being much more um, sort of attuned in terms of the evidence. Um, and also, unfortunately, the world is a dangerous place. Um, and at the moment, what we're doing is we've got something happening where we don't have a sense of control. We don't know how we can find a solution in order to deal with that. Um, I've just put a quote up in terms of what internet um, trolling is um, and it's just really important to have an awareness so when we're asking the questions it's looking at the credibility of information so go back to the sources and say is this an accurate source where it's evidence-based where it's been tested um, and it's just being aware of your own vulnerabilities so if you are if you are feeling vulnerable and anxious it means that we may be looking for solutions from sources who aren't credible. So I'm going to just bring that to a close. And I think we might have about three minutes for questions, which I think is on the next slide. OK, 
That's absolutely smashing. I'd like to say thank you so much to the panel. I've really enjoyed listening to all your contributions and I hope our audience have. Would anybody like to put their microphone on um, or ask a question? Just to say to you that all these sessions are recorded and they are put in the research and development website so that you can listen if you've come in late or missed part of it um, you can always go and listen to them so I know we answered a goodly number of questions Sheila was on the chat which was very helpful okay so I can't see any questions coming up what I'm going to do now is switch the recording off